What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode four of the It's Coming podcast. I'm your host, Noah Mwat. It's great to be back. Now, it's been a while since we have hit the airwaves with another pause for the UConn men's basketball team due to COVID, plus final exams for school. We figured we'd take a little break before we recorded episode four. Now, that being said, we lost my co-host, Matt Gepfert, this week to family obligations. So we've got another guest joining the pod today. So without any further ado, it's episode four of the It's Coming podcast. Kemba Walker, step back, Walker, party at Kemba! And the Huskies are the top dog in 2011. El Amin comes over and says we shot the world. Up ahead to put that to the rim! You know, people better get us now. That's all. You better get us now because it, it's coming. Welcome back. Today I'm joined by Josh Schlachtis, a fellow UCTV sports member and a junior at UConn. Josh, thanks for joining me today and allowing Matt to spend Christmas with the family. All right, thanks, Noam. I'm really excited to be on this podcast talk about UConn men's basketball. Let's get it. Yeah, let's do it. So, Josh, last time we saw UConn play, it was, quite frankly, a surprising performance for many of us. Coming off a a two-and-a-half-week hiatus due to the COVID shutdown, UConn came out and played Creighton in a game that, in Dan Hurley's own words, UConn should have won. So, first things first, let's look at the positives from that game, which obviously has to start with James Booknight. Yeah, so you talk about James Booknight against Creighton. Let's go surface-level stats, 40 points, 4 rebounds, 2 assists, over 50% from the field, over 40% from three. He was great. I mean, those stats say all they need to say. He was great. But let's take a deeper look because I honestly think that it's more impressive when you do. You look at preseason awards. Placed on the preseason biggie's second team was James Booknight. Named preseason player of the year, Marcus Zagorowski of Creighton. Now, of course, as our guest from last time, John Fanta, mentioned, putting Booknight on that second team was a crime, but... The fact of the matter is Book Knight was going up against the guy who everyone thought was going to be better than this year. And I think we all know by how the game turned out, Book Knight showed out. 40 points to Zagorowski's 11. He proved them wrong, at least for the game. And then you look at stakes of the game. Creighton was the number nine team in the nation. The Biggie's version of the Golden State Warriors with their shooting prowess. And if UConn won this game, they would have been an automatic inclusion in the top 25. James Book Knight, with all of that, put the team on his back and was two missed free throws away, which we'll get to later, from carrying UConn to the biggest win, arguably since the 2016 NCAA tournament win over Colorado in the first round. It was his toughest competition with the highest stakes and extra motivation to play for, and he had the best performance of his career. Yeah, and it's a young career still. Um, You know, as UConn fans, like, we're so hyper-focused on this kid because we've watched him play, we've seen what he's capable of, we saw his magical run at the end of last season, But for the national audience, you know, this was James Booknight's coming out party. 40 points in the first Big East game for UConn in seven years. Um, Everybody's talking about him now. He's got a target on his back. But, you know, the whole plan going in for Booknight was two years at UConn and then move on to the NBA. So that being said, before we get into anything more with this Creighton game, Josh, I want to ask you about James Booknight's draft stock and where you think it is. Yeah, well, if you go on NBADraft.net, Book Knight right now is listed at number 14, so he's a lottery spot. That seems to be the consensus around that he's going to be late lottery. And he's around the level of the names of guys like Josh Christopher from, from Arizona State, Moses Moody from Arkansas, and, of course, David Duke from Providence, another Big East team. And in all honesty, I think he's better than all three of them. He's 6'5 and a shooting guard, which means he's not really undersized. He's incredibly athletic. We all know how he jumps out the gym. James Book Knight is just known for his dunks and his play above the rim. But he also has elite, and when I say elite, I mean top-level body control. You look about the Creighton game, the, the play that we'll get to obviously later because it was so ridiculous with Christian Bishop knocking the ball out of his hands while he's making a layup, and he still manages to finish the end one. Another where he goes up and then down and then back up for the reverse layup. That body control is NBA level. He plays lockdown defense and is a true two-way guard. We all saw the play with Denzel Mahoney against Creighton. He locked him down for two shots. He has a very good court vision, and when he wants to pass, he can be a good passer. He is a top-notch finisher, NBA-level finisher, both above the rim, as we know, and even below the rim. We saw a lot of plays. He's similar to R.J. Barrett in that way, who we all remember is a top-three selection and playing it like it right now, kind of a lesser version of, I'm going to put the name out there, James Harden, in terms of that finishing ability. 
And that's, that's the kind of finisher he is. And he also has a consistent jumper. He's a really, really good player. And if he keeps up this high quality of play, James Booknight could easily find his way into the top 10 in a draft that has been touted as arguably the best draft class to come out since at least 2011, which featured Kyrie, Kawhi, Clay, Jimmy Butler, Vucevic, and of course, Kemba Walker. And Booknight's made a lot of steps just since last year as well. Um, it's obviously early you know, only four games in his sophomore season, but his jumper is a lot more consistent. Um, he's turning the ball over less. He's playing a lot more consistent and reliable defense. He's staying out of foul trouble. And that was a big, big issue for him last year. It limited his minutes a lot early on because he just he couldn't play defense. He was caught reaching, caught out of position. And so he ended up playing, you know, 20 to 24 minutes a game versus last game against Creighton. Now it went into overtime, but he played 40 minutes. So let's go back to that Creighton game. Uh, as we all know, UConn was up four with just 21 seconds to go. Usually it's a recipe for a win. But then Creighton managed to crawl back in it. They hit a tying shot uh, with just over, you know, I think it was 0.4 seconds or 0.2 seconds to go in regulation. And then Creighton ended up winning it in OT, which a lot of us saw coming. So a lot of criticism after the game was directed at RJ Cole, who people, I guess, forgot that he locked down Marcus Zagorowski literally all game long. Zagorowski couldn't do anything, but RJ missed a pair of free throws with 11 seconds to go, kept the game at two, allowed Creighton to get, you know, the final shot uh, near the buzzer. So Josh, just talk to me about, you know, what RJ did post game on Twitter, um, sort of his leadership, what he was saying, how he was holding himself accountable. And then also just what was the UConn fans response on Twitter and how was that encouraging to you? Yeah, so after a big loss like that, especially when, you know, a lot of the blame may fall on a guy like RJ Cole's shoulders, I think it was handled in a very surprising way. I have the tweet here that he posted on Twitter that Noah mentioned, and it went like this. UConn Nation, earlier today was a tough loss. I missed two huge free throws, but as the point guard and one of the leaders of the team, I'd put myself in that position every time because that's who I am and I have the utmost confidence in myself and my abilities. I owe y'all one. And, you know, that's a very mature thing for RJ to do. You know, he, he owned up to the fact that he, I guess for lack of a better term, blew the game. And you'd think, you know, the UConn fans probably were not happy about the game. But here were the majority of the responses when looking through of the UConn fans on, on that Twitter comment. Number one, you don't owe us one. You got to keep grinding. Remember the excellent defense you played against Zagorowski. It was an off night. Keep your head up, and we know you work hard for us. Those were the sentiments that you got from the comment section of that Twitter post. And, you know, I think that's really big because RJ had, as Noah mentioned, as you mentioned, a good game. He had obviously some ups. He scored 12 points, was the leading scorer behind Book, got the steal that led to the crazy Book layup with Bishop. And, as you mentioned, Noam, Marcus Zagorowski was locked down, and that was RJ's defensive assignment the entire game. Zagorowski finished with 11 points while under 30% from the field and shot one of eight from three. Now, of course, RJ had very low efficiency and missed the two free throws that cost UConn the game. But when you look at RJ's importance to this team, I think what the fans did in responding so, I guess, kindly to him in, in giving him confidence in showing you know, why he's that important to the team and showing him that... The UConn needs to be needs to have RJ Cole to succeed. I'm going to take you guys. I'm going to take you through Noam, a bunch of the other teams in the Big East. Here are the players who scored 10 points or more on those teams so far this season. Villanova has Colin Gillespie, Jeremiah Robinson, Earl, Justin Moore, and Caleb Daniels. Creighton has Marcus Zagorowski, Mitch Ballack, Denzel Mahoney, Christian Bishop, and Damian Jefferson. Marquette has Jamal Kane, DJ Carton, Comey McEwen, Dawson Garcia. And Xavier has Paul Scruggs, Zach Fremantle, Nate Johnson, and Kiki Tandy. Those are a lot of names, but the point is on all of those teams, there are four or five players all scoring in double figures. UConn, James Booknight, RJ Cole. That's it. I mean, Whaley's scoring 9.8. He's close. But RJ Cole, that's his importance to the team. He is the guy. He is the Robin to Booknight's Batman. And we're going to need, UConn is going to need RJ to succeed alongside Book if they want a chance to be more than just a third place team in the Big East. Yeah, and you know, what was encouraging too is just Dan Hurley's mindset. Um, obviously, we all saw Al Tariq Gilbert struggle last year. Um, there was a game against Xavier where he had a couple possessions that he got blocked in late, a couple turnovers late in games. But throughout the whole season, Dan Hurley stuck by his side. And that's exactly what Dan Hurley did post game with RJ Cole. He said, you know what? We're going to get behind RJ, and we're going to support him. And, you know, UConn should have won those two, won that game even if RJ Cole had missed both those free throws like he did. You know, 
that isn't what cost them the game. There were other mistakes they made, other areas they could have cleaned up, other possessions they could have got could have had buckets that they didn't. But what's important is that Dan Hurley and RJ Cole's teammates and the UConn fans are supporting him. And this is why Dan Hurley is going to continue to get recruits, to get transfers with the high caliber of play and toughness and competitiveness and character like RJ Cole because Dan Hurley supports them. He has their back. So a couple other takeaways that I have from the Creighton game were just how well prepared UConn was after such a long break. Uh, we all came in thinking, you know, maybe they'll play a close first half. They'll probably end up slipping in the second half looking fatigued and, you know, Creighton will probably win by, you know, 10 or 15. So when UConn went down by 12 midway through the first half, uh, it looked like Blue Jays were going to run away with it. But UConn pulled back. They kept it close. Big thing, big thing, big thing. Foul trouble for the Huskies was killer. Isaiah Whaley and Adama Sanogo were both in foul trouble pretty much the whole game, and Whaley fouled out before overtime, which was brutal. It left the defense with gaping holes in the post that Creighton just exploited time and time again. In addition, the three-point ball was not falling, and UConn would not realize that on offense. They shot 7 of 30 from deep. That's 23%, and it felt like whenever they stopped shooting threes and ran better offense with more ball movement and more taking the ball to the hoop, the offense was executing much, much better. Yeah, and I mean, simply to put it, to, to go to that last point, UConn cannot be forcing up threes if they want to win. Now, Creighton had two major runs that game. One, as Noah mentioned, as you mentioned, at the start of the game, and then one in overtime that put the game out of reach. Both times, both times, the same thing was happening. UConn was shooting every three-point shot they could find, and it was forced. There were times where UConn would shoot up a three in transition, Isaiah Whaley would pull down the rebound, pass the ball back out, they'd throw the ball around the wing, and shoot up another contested three. I mean, it, it was every single time that happened, as you mentioned, the offense was looking stagnant. Now, maybe they wanted to keep up with Creighton. Shooting is something that Creighton's known for with Balak and Zagorowski. But as you said, when the forced shooting stopped, the offense flowed, and it flowed better than it had. I mean, but they, they looked incredible. And that, of course, was also the same time where Book Knight scored the vast majority of his points. Book night was better. The team looked better. They were honestly shooting the ball better, even though they weren't trying. And that's when UConn came back. That's when UConn pulled out a little bit of a lead. And that's when UConn was playing its best. Now, to your other point about fouling out, it, it, it's massive what happened with Whaley. Foul trouble with the, the big guys is killer because right now it's Whaley, Sonogo, and Carlton. Before a cook comes back, those are the three guys that are playing minutes at the big man spot. Now, in the Creighton game, when UConn lost Whaley, they gave up two easy layups towards the end of the game with no contest at the hoop. Literally nobody was even in the vicinity. Arjikul was behind Zagorowski on one of them. Nobody was there. And finally, for the last play of the game, they subbed in Carlton, who was guarding Christian Bishop. And then, of course, 6'5", Damian Jefferson, who has very long arms, being guarded by 6'2", Jalen Gaffney, our point guard, hit the shot that sent the game into overtime. UConn needs size, and when Whaley's gone, UConn doesn't have size because they don't have a cookback. And of course, in overtime, Christian Bishop feasted. Their big man, 6'7", guy feasted. So Whaley needs to avoid fouling out because what we saw, I mean, he, that, that basically cost us the game. Once we went into overtime with no Isaiah Whaley, it was looking very bleak for the Huskies. And secondly, and we'll get to this in a little bit, when a cook gets back, this team will be so much better because he adds that depth at the big man spot. Now, a little bit more about the big man. Um, this is probably Isaiah Whaley's quote-unquote worst game this season which is saying a lot because he didn't play poorly. Um, he was a presence out there. He blocked a bunch of shots, grabbed a bunch of rebounds, was efficient uh, in the paint. But as Dan Hurley said post game, like, look, I, Isaiah just, he just can't afford to get into foul trouble because he is the anchor of the UConn defense. Um, and if you had said that at the start of last year, people would have said you were crazy. But that's Isaiah Whaley's importance right now. He's just so valuable to this defense, especially until a cook, a cook gets back. And we know how good of a shot blocker a cook, a cook can be. There were games last year where guys literally would not shoot the ball in the paint because they were too scared to get blocked by a cook, a cook. So, you know, big men got to step up. I think Adama Sanogo will continue to improve as the team gets more practice time. And I think that we may start to see a little bit of Richie Springs. Um, this team could use a bit of a boost on the boards. Creighton kind of killed them on the boards last game. Uh, got a lot of second chance points. But looking forward, UConn has a few days off for Christmas right now. Then they're going to resume practice before DePaul comes to town December 30th. The first game of the series against DePaul was scheduled to be in Chicago on the 23rd, but it was postponed uh, due to DePaul's COVID issues. The Connecticut Department of Health said, nope, you're not going to play that. 
uh, DePaul hadn't cleared their 14-day quarantine or something along those lines, and they ended up playing some random team from Illinois. Anyhow, UConn and DePaul will play December 30th. Josh, what do you expect to see from UConn first and foremost when we see them next? And on the flip side, what can we expect from a DePaul team that has just played one game so far and will only be playing their third game of the season when they play UConn? Yeah, so UConn's going to come out with something to prove, right? I mean, we all can say how great they looked against Creighton. They almost beat the number nine team in the nation. But at the end of the day, they lost. And you know Dan Hurley is going in there saying and talking to them, building up that cauldron of intensity that we've heard about so many times. And the fact of the matter is UConn is going to come out with a fire on their back. They're going to be ready to play. Book Knight is going to be ready to play. And I'll tell you one thing, RJ Cole is going to be ready to prove some people wrong. He is going to come out and play ferocious defense on Charlie Moore. And now we'll look at DePaul here. DePaul won its first game against Western Illinois, putting them at a 1-0 record. And you look at their team, they're run by two players pretty much, but have some pretty solid depth around them. As I mentioned, Charlie Moore was a preseason Big East first team selection, led the DePaul team in scoring last year as well. He's a really strong point guard, very nimble, very agile. He's a guard who shoots the ball at a very high rate, and you know he's, he's a killer for that DePaul backcourt. Very, very good player. And then you have, have Romeo Weems. He was named to the Big East All-Freshman team last year. He's a strong athletic wing who also could hear his name called during the NBA draft later in 2021 after book, but still will hear his name called. And he's a very strong and dynamic player who has a decent shot as well. Uh, in our Big East Breakdown segment that UCTV put out, we listed Weems as the breakout player of the year. And I think that's a pretty big uh, matchup to watch, Book versus Weems on the wing. Then you have the supporting cast around them. They have a couple guys. Javon Freeman Liberty in their first game put up 19 points. Kobe Elvis put up a stat line of 12 points, four assists on 67% three-point shooting in their first game. Kobe Elvis, of course, is their major recruit coming out of high school for this year. And then you have Nick Ongenda, who had 12 points and six blocks filling in that a cook role for the DePaul Blue Demons in their first game. So, look, UConn's going to be the clear favorites coming into this game. DePaul finished last in the conference of the Big East last year. But it should be fun to see an improved DePaul team take on the newcomers of the Big East in their first of many matchups in this Big East uh, matchup. Yeah. Yeah, so Josh mentioned uh, the Big East breakdowns. He, alongside Richard Prosser, broke down every Big East opponent for UConn men's basketball. It's all up on our YouTube, UCTV Channel 14, so we'll try and post them before all the games on Twitter. But if you're tuned into this, make sure you go and check out a little preview on DePaul. So before, Josh, we before we get into our segments, uh, let's go through a quick injury update. Um, there's a little bit of news from stores. So first is Andre Jackson, who has really struggled to get going this season through all the COVID pauses. He broke a bone in his wrist in practice this week. Um, he's going to be out indefinitely. Uh, he doesn't even really know what play had happened. Apparently, it started getting sore the next day. But that's just a tough break for this kid who a lot of people thought was going to be uh, on a similar trajectory as James Booknight. You know, round into shape, middle of the season, really burst onto the scene at the end of the year, and next year take over the team. So we'll see how long Andre Jackson's out. You know, broken wrist that could be, you know, we're not doctors, but anywhere six to eight weeks or so. Um, Tyler Polly obviously didn't clear the COVID protocols and was out against Creighton, but that also sort of gives his knee a little bit more time to get into game shape. Uh, he didn't look great in the game against Hartford and against USC. He was in foul trouble in both those games, couldn't really get himself going. So maybe a game off was good for Tyler just to have a little mental clarity and to strengthen that knee back a little bit more into game shape. And Josh, it looks like a cook a cook is just a couple games away from his debut this season after that torn Achilles last year. So let's let's hear it a little bit more. What is he going to add to this team when he returns? Yeah, I mean, quick comments on Andre and Tyler. Andre Jackson obviously not having the best start to the season, but he is a dynamic player, and UConn fans can't forget that. he. There's a reason he was so highly touted, and this is going to hurt, but you know, I think he'll work on it, and he'll come back strong after the injury. And obviously Tyler Polly coming back adds a three-point presence to this team as well as some size, so hopefully they get back soon. But to get to a cook a cook, I mean, he just adds so much. Cook adds depth to the UConn size, will make UConn less vulnerable to foul trouble within the bigs. I mean, you think about it, if Whaley goes out, as awful as that is, a Cook a Cook's there. If a Cook goes out due to foul trouble, as, as tough as that is, Whaley's there. Those two guys are the stalwarts of the defense. They are incredible shot blockers. And what they're going to be doing together is going to be impressive. 
So, as we see, Cook adds an incredible defensive presence as he brings in that tandem with him and Whaley there on, in the starting lineup eventually as Cook gets his way back at that big man spot. He'll make UConn suffocating on defense. As you mentioned, Noam, there were teams that didn't want to shoot the ball or in the paint with a Cook there. Now add Whaley, who's a year or I guess an offseason later from his rise. They together is going to be easily one of the best shot blocking tandems in the nation. Not even the conference, the nation. UConn almost led the nation last year and blocked with a Cook alone. He'll make the jobs of every single player on the court easier defensively. I mean, think about it. With the paint basically clogged up by a Cook and Whaley, all the guards have less work to do. And I think eventually a Cook will end, uh, will work his way to being an even better contributor on offense than he was last year. He is a good offensive player. He just needed some polish. And, you know, he, he's gained a lot of weight. He looks really good coming off. And as long as, you know, he works his way back from the injury, because that is still definitely a thing. It's an Achilles. It's a tough injury. He's going to have to work his way back. But if he's able to get, you know, back to his, 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 I guess, where he was or even where I think he can be, which is even better, UConn has a legitimate shot, and I mean this, a legitimate shot at winning the Big East. So much more size than any other team UConn has with him there. They have a Cook, Whaley, Adama, Carlton, Polly. That's a lot of size, and we just saw them play really hard against Creighton. With a Cook back, UConn can win the Big East. So two notable Achilles injuries from stars in the professional. Uh, Brianna Stewart, UConn alum. She came back from her Achilles injury, went on to win the WNBA title with the Storm. She was named WNBA Finals MVP. And then obviously Kevin Durant, uh, he went through it with the Warriors, and now he's on the Nets, and he looks 100% too. So, you know, you got to believe that a cook, when he comes back, he's going to be ready. And you feel bad because these two COVID pauses, Hurley has talked about how much it's hampered a cook's ability to get back into live action during practice and get back on the court. And you know a cook, he's a fierce competitor. He can't wait to be back out there with UConn. But Josh, moving into our segments, the first one is, it's a cupcake. Uh, let's hear your MVP of the week. Oh, MVP of the week. Yeah, yeah, you, this is tough. Um, so I'm going to go with James Booknight. <laughs> 40 points, top 10 Creighton team that he played against. And he almost carried them to a win. Next question. Next question. Yeah, that's an easy one. So Josh, I want to hear, uh, what is your hot take or overreaction of the week? All right, we're gonna stick on the James Book Night train. On the James Book Night train, um, you can call it an overreaction to one game, but James Book Night will win Big East Player of the Year. It's a hot take overreaction, but just listen. Like he put up forty points against the preseason Big East Player of the Year in Marcus Zagorowski. Zagorowski, in response, put up eleven. Book Night, and yes, this is a funny one-game statistic. Currently averaging forty in the Big East. Obviously, that's not going to continue. But the fact of the matter is, it could stay within the twenties. And that's pretty big. And if UConn finishes above third place in the standings, it'll be because of Book Knight. He is the best player in the Big East. The only guys who can really compete with that are the two on Villanova in Colin Gillespie and Jeremiah Robinson Earl. And then you can argue Paul Scruggs from Xavier. But, you know, Book Knight, Big East Player of the Year, watch out. Yeah, Josh, I think that's a good overreaction. Um, he looked just absolutely locked in against Creighton. And when you're in the Big East, you're playing a good team every week. It's not the American where you're playing a team like Tulane one day and then the next week you're playing you know a division three opponent like ECU like that that's not happening in the Big East there's not going to be any lackadaisical games he's going to be locked in but our next segment is the get him next time segment and I'll go first on this one so all, all offseason we heard you know how UConn learned how to win close games last year valid they did um, but then they had their first real test this season against Creighton and they stumbled and now granted it was off two and a half weeks of no practice, really, uh, no games due to COVID. So they were playing minimal practice against a great team. But next time that opportunity comes in a close game, UConn's got to capitalize. They played such a short non-conference schedule with really just one quality opponent in Southern California that all of these Big East games are of heightened importance. You know, the veterans got to step up. They got to take control. They got to make sure that every single possession down the stretch counts doesn't end in turnovers, doesn't end in missed free throws, and they got to close down these close games and show us that they did truly learn how to win last season. Yeah, last year, obviously, they got better as the season went along with that, and so hopefully they do the same this year. Uh, but they look good. They look good in that aspect, even through the miss of the last game. Mine is that RJ Cole will hit his free throws. Uh, he obviously missed the two that cost UConn the game, but he was also shooting 100% from the line before those misses. So some jinx came in, some announcer jinx when they said he didn't miss. He choked. He got beat by pressure, but he owned it. 
He has the support from his coaches, his teammates, and the fans, and now has experience in the types of settings like that. He is ready to be back in that position. He said it on his Twitter. He will get them next time. He will make those free throws next time. Now, Josh, our last segment uh, is the play of the week. Now, we only have one game to choose from, but there were a lot of uh, pretty, pretty exciting plays. But what's your pick? Yeah, so we've talked about book night. I'm going with Tyrese Martin here. That dunk by Tyrese Martin was electric. It was crazy. He got the ball off of a pass from, I think it was Adama Sonogo on the post. He came in. No one was there except for the guy, Alex O'Connell, coming in from the free throw line, who's going up for the block. What does Tyrese Martin do? He takes the ball from the high spot, comes down with it, and when that happened, I was sitting there thinking, all right, he's going to do a nice little reverse layup. Nope. He comes around the basket and dunks it down. Alex O'Connell, by the way, is a Duke transfer that transferred, of course, to Creighton. That's the guy he was going against, and it was incredibly impressive to see the body motion there, the, just the stability that he had and the ferociousness of that dunk. Yeah, and that dunk actually came in Sports Center Top 10, number 7. Uh, shout out to UCTV Sports alumni Kyle Berry, production assistant at, at ESPN, who gave a tip to the Top 10 cutter that day and said, get Tyrese Martin in Sports Center Top 10. Done, I'm not. My top play of the week, I'm actually going to cheat, and I'm going to say it is James Booknight's acrobatic layups because it's too hard to just choose one. You know, first, early in the game, comes off on RJ Steele. Josh, you've referenced this one. Book goes up and under, gets the ball stripped from his hands, and still manages to spin it off the glass, count the bucket, and one. Then, later in the game, second half, backdoor cut, he splits two defenders in the air. Then he goes up and under for the reverse layup. I mean, that was ridiculous. First of all, just splitting the two defenders and hitting the layup is tough. But splitting the two, then going up and under for the, for the reverse, that is next level. Then later, comes off a Sonogo screen right around uh, midcourt, top of the key. He drives down the lane. He, he goes up like he's going to throw it down and adjusts midair. You know, that was Michael Jordan-esque. Finishes the and one soaring layup, one of multiple and ones for him. Now, last year, every time Book took off, it was to dunk. There was the game against Iona. He tried to put the guy on the poster of the century, ended up throwing the ball off the backboard and getting called for the charge. But this year, James Booknet has taken it to the next level. He still has that ability to throw it down, put a guy on a poster, but he also has the craft and the skill to finish the layup and get fouled, and he's a consistent free throw shooter. And that's what you need from a guy who's going to go as a lottery pick. He's got to take the next level, not just go for the highlight plays, but get the bucket, get fouled, and hit your free throws. Now, as always, Josh, we're going to close out with our Hurley Juice of the Week, where we pick the best soundbite from the head coach in the past week. We're going to get behind him, and we're going to support him. And, and uh, you know, I, I thought that, you know, he really battled uh, one of the best point guards in the country, uh, minus the, you know, missing the, 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 the big free throws. I mean, he did, you know, like, you know, him and, you know, him and Zigorowski were kind of a push today. So if you would have told me that at that at the point guard position it would kind of be a push, we definitely would have taken RJ's game. But give the guy some time. You know, he sat out a full year and he's had a brutal and just like all of us, he has not had a traditional lead up to conference play. Thanks everybody for tuning in to the Yet's Coming podcast. And thanks to Josh Schlactus for filling in this week. UConn is scheduled to take on DePaul on Wednesday at 9 p.m. Until then, enjoy your holidays, stay safe and healthy. And go Huskies.